I'm Randy Rohde, and I'm fascinated with entrepreneurs and small business owners. Plus, I love baseball. Every show, I sit down with a small business owner, and we discuss their running the bases of entrepreneurship. We throw the ball around on strategy, management, execution, and innovation. Plus, a little fun baseball talk. Hey, thanks for joining us today. Settle in, grab your Cracker Jacks, and you know what they say. Play ball! And it's a great day for a ball game. Hey, this is Randy Rohde, running the bases with small businesses. And today's guest comes to us from the great state of Oklahoma. This busy mom of two became an accidental entrepreneur. We're going to hear a little bit more about that. Uh, When the public relations company that she had been working with from her college internship to eventually becoming COO and partner, they hit some big stumbling blocks and she knew she had to pivot. So she did so by creating her own public relations agency. She is known as an expert at keeping complex projects on task and within budget while clearly communicating her clients' brands. With more than 14 years of public relations and marketing experience, she's advised various industries, including social services, healthcare, transportation, retail, technology, and finance. Furthermore, she leverages her experience and skills in public service and marketing in the academia, serving as an adjunct professor at Oklahoma State University. So there we go. Please welcome to the show, CEO of Resolute public relations, Nicole Morgan. Nicole, good morning. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Randy. Thanks for having me. Hey, so our researchers, you know, kind of find the most fascinating pieces of information on people. And this one, I'm not even sure exactly where uh, she found this one, but the, uh, the info that I have in front of me says that you have been to the Netherlands 27 times. Is that right? And I'm going again next week. And you're going again. <laughs> Do you have a client yeah. over there? What do you do over there? No. So my, my mom's from the Netherlands. Her whole family is there. And so I like to go back at least every other year if I can. Sometimes I've been going more than that. But I'm just really trying to keep the connections there with all of my aunts and uncles and my cousins and, and to, to bridge that for my children too. So yeah, it's, it's my happy place. It's really where I get to go and unplug and eat all the good food and everything. That's incredible. 27 yeah. times. Well, you, you <laughs> well traveled, uh, at least on that path. Here's a little fun fact as well. Did you know that the Dutch are the tallest nation in the world? I do. My family is very short. So <laughs> we did not get that gene. We we've been told that so many times, but I mean, I'm five, four, my mom's oh my I think gosh. five, three. So yeah, we're, we're not the tallest people, but um, <laughs> that is, that is a true fact. They're also the most relaxed people in the world. There've been a lot of studies on that. So oh, really? um, they have a lot going for them. Nice. Well, you really <laughs> must kind of stand out, so to speak, you know, if you're the by four. I think the I, average height is like six foot for men and just under that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And dark hair. I mean, they're, they're always very thrown off because I'm fluent in Dutch having been there so much and, and yeah. kind of grown up around my family. So people are always kind of thrown off when I start, start speaking Dutch to them, but it's uh, yeah, it's like I said, it's always kind of been home for me. Oh, that's fun. I'd love to get over there someday. Mm-hmm. So you say you're an accidental entrepreneur and I think we found a quote that says, like me, my grandfather was a bit of an accidental entrepreneur. So explain what that means to you. How did you, and for that matter, even your grandfather become an accidental entrepreneur? Yeah. So, so my grandfather um, lived in the Netherlands and he uh, was always in sales. And so he had started working for a, a company that sold allergy medication that was looking to start essentially a franchise in the Netherlands. It was a German company. And so he was helping the the franchisee set everything up and had been putting all this work into it. And right before the business launched, the franchisee said, I, you know what, I've changed my mind. I don't want to do this anymore. And my grandfather at the time, I think was in his mid forties. He had seven kids. Um, 
you know, that's a pretty big thing to pull the rug out from under you. And, wow. and he said, well, can I just take over then? And, and the guy said, yeah, sure. Have at it. And so he did it, um, ended up being one of the only distributors of allergy medication in the Netherlands and um, had a very successful business Two, three of his kids now run that business. And so, um, and so it's been quite a legacy. And I remember going as a child, there weren't a lot of kids in the neighborhood. And so I would go help in the business and, you know, put stickers on things and lick <laughs> envelopes and, and just got to kind of be there for that. And, yeah. and so maybe in hindsight, that sparked something in me seeing that this was something that was possible. But um, as you kind of had mentioned in your intro, I, the company that I worked for, I started as an intern and stayed there for 10 years. So I was very loyal to the company, really loved what I was doing, um, and never had any ambitions of starting my own, um, organization, but things kind of transpired and there were a lot of roadblocks that started to happen. Um, the owner had some pretty, uh, significant personal challenges and his name was on the door. And um, it just became very clear that the company was not going to be able to continue um, the way that it was. I had, do you want me to jump into the, the kind of the light bulb moment that yes. turned it all for I wanna, me? Okay. I want to hear the light bulb. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so things were really progressing. Um, owner of the company really, if I saw him once every two weeks, that was good. He just, he really, he wasn't really engaged. Um, and that was great for me because the more, the less he would do, the more I would do. And, um, and I had really great relationships with my clients, but as things were unfolding in his personal life, I had clients saying, Hey, you know, are, is he still involved? Are things still going to be, you know, is the company still going to be around? And, and I was really working to try to bridge all of that because like I said, I really loved my job and it, it got to the point where I was supposed to go on vacation with my family and, and traveling is just, it's really, I need that to recharge and to, to unplug and to have that quality time with my family. And so I, I was on vacation with them and it was a road trip to New York. So not a short, not a short trip from Tulsa. And the whole time we're just talking about this. And I'm sure my husband was like, oh my gosh, like, please just make a decision already. <laughs> and before I left, I started having people saying, Nicole, you've basically been running the company. Why don't you just start your own? And I said, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that to my boss. But it got to the point where I was on vacation and actually had to book a flight to come home to meet with some of my clients because it was getting that bad. And I'm sitting in the airport by myself. I've just left my family on vacation. And I was like, this just isn't worth it. It's not worth it. And so kind of in that moment, I just decided I was going to come home, quit my job, hang my own shingle and see what happened. And, and that's, that's kind of how it started. Wow. And eight years later, it's worked out. So. And then here you go. <laughs> right. Yes. So, yeah. so you've never looked back. So now the company that you have is uh, Resolute Public Relations. Tell us about Resolute. What do you do? Uh, what kind of clients do you serve? Yeah. So I um, always knew that the field of public relations was changing. And when I got my degree at Oklahoma State, it was very, you, you got a degree in public relations, or you got a degree in advertising, or you went the journalism route. It, it was very segmented. Um, as I started working in the field, um, I, when I say this to to my students now, they're like, oh my gosh, but you know, Facebook was invented when, <laughs> when I was in, in college and was just kind of starting to take off. And so one of the things that I really loved about my job was that my clients would let me test things. And so I'm seeing Facebook and I'm kind of starting to learn about search engine optimization. And I had a client that got a million dollar investment to completely rebrand and rename their company. And so I got to be really involved in that part of the business. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of starting to see how all these pieces work together. For example, as I was working on some search engine optimization for this client's new website, I'm seeing that all of the articles that I'd been pitching to the media were showing up on the first page of Google. And that kind of, you know, little, a little bit of a light bulb for me where I was thinking, okay, how are these things connected? And so when I started Resolute, it was really an opportunity for me to Yes, people know me for public relations, but to really start an agency that was going to be fully integrated from day one. And, and that's really how we've moved forward. We believe that you cannot do one thing anymore to be successful because everything is so integrated. And so we build custom plans for our clients to help them achieve their goals. That's fascinating. That's good. So 
you started, so it's been about eight years um, with Resolute. Did you have, and so you started, you know, as you say, kind of as the college intern to all of a sudden now you're running your own company. What kind of a learning curve was that for you? I can't even, I can't even verbalize <laughs> what the learning curve was. Uh, again, there, because we were so segmented, I didn't take a lot of business classes. So there were a lot of things that I just, I did not know how to do. Um, and I also didn't have a lot of knowledge for my previous company on, on, on how to do them. Um, I think there were a lot of, in hindsight now, and having run my own business, there are a lot of things that I would have done differently had the previous company been mine. And so it was, it was a blessing to be able to start from scratch, but I have always said, if I don't know the answer to something, or this isn't my area of expertise, I'm going to have to bring in help. And so I lean really heavily on, um, the professionals that I've hired to help me, you know, my CPA, I feel like I talk to him all the time. I have two different business consultants, one who has worked in PR firms and really understands the finances and how to run an agency. I have another one who's more skilled in HR and operations. Um, so there, there are a lot of things where, you know, you kind of don't know what you don't know until you hit this, this wall and you're, you're going, Oh no, how do I get over this? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I think that's <laughs> so true with so many uh, entrepreneurs, myself included. Sometimes you just don't know what you don't know until yeah. you need to know. Yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we were really lucky in the beginning. Um, we, there was actually a, um, a co-working space that opened here mm -hmm. locally and it was, it was a locally owned um, run by family foundations who really have a heart for entrepreneurship. And one of those family foundations was a client of ours. And so we were actually actively promoting this co-working space, trying to get it filled. And the more I was learning about it, the more I started to think, you know, this could be something that would be really helpful for me. And so we were one of the, the first companies to actually office there. And that was tremendously helpful just being around other entrepreneurs because it, one, it helped me realize, okay, if I don't know the answer to this. I'm not the only one. It's not that I, you know, just really got into something that I know nothing about. This is natural. And two, there was a network of professionals that they could connect me with who had already walked that path. I actually have some notes about that particular place. I think it, uh, 36 degrees north, is that the name yeah. of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I love the idea and kind of that community. And you mentioned earlier just a few minutes ago and that you had some business consultants uh, now helping you, guiding you through some various expertise that they have uh, in operating a business. When you were initially uh, running or when you initially started Resolute, you were operating in this kind of um, uh, co-working uh, space. It sounds like you kind of had this built-in uh, kind of support group of other entrepreneurs in there with you. Would you recommend that environment as well to others? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it depends on where you are in your business. We definitely hit a point where we realized we had outgrown the space. But when we first moved in, I had just hired my second employee. So we were a team of three. And I knew how to wrap my arms around that. I, I was really just going, oh, I think there's something to this. And I think that I could grow this business and this would be fun was really kind of where my mind was at. Um, but then once things really started taking off, I mean, within the the span of a year and a half, we were up to six employees. And at that point, it, they kind of built the space to um, that you would outgrow it at some point. I mean, our office was really made for for three people The the conference rooms, you know, if you're in there having meetings, you book those for an hour. So if your meeting runs over, somebody else is out there waving going, hey, I booked this too. So we were kind of taking over a lot of spaces more than the other coworkers. And so we just realized we were getting to the point where we needed our own space. But in the interim, to not have to worry about the copier not working, to have a receptionist who could field, you know, salespeople who would just stop by wanting to talk to me. Um, there was one day where I was in the kitchen and I was just completely overwhelmed. And they always had free food, by the way, which was oh, another, <laughs> another perk. <laughs> there was a chocolatier right next door. So they were always bringing us their leftovers. So I'm standing in the kitchen, probably stuffing my face with chocolate and the director of the space came over and he said, um, do you want an advisor? Do you need someone to talk to? And I was like, oh my 
my God, yes. <laughs> and to have someone see that for you yeah. um, was really helpful because I could see where I would have floundered had I been on my own. The moment, or I, I guess when you decided that you needed to move on or it was time to move on, really was because of the growth that you were experiencing mm-hmm. as a company, which is always exciting and always encouraging. I'm curious in your particular world in, in PR, um, do you think, is it easier or harder to be in the PR field now versus when you first started? Well, if, if we're going to talk strictly public relations, then I definitely think it's more difficult. Um, a lot of the, the more traditional tactics that PR professionals use working with the media, working with reporters, um, it's just changed drastically. The media landscape has, has changed so much. Um, there used to be local publications in every single community here in Oklahoma. I would have no problem saying I could pitch, you know, in place probably four to five articles a month. Mm. Um, and, and I would start there and then I would always get more because there was so much opportunity. And now it's, that's just not the landscape. I and mean, when we have one daily newspaper, the business section is being run essentially by one person right. and, and it's so thin. So it's not that they don't want to cover the stories, but there are just so few people to cover them. Um, and so I, I am really thankful that I made the choice from the beginning to be a more integrated firm. And I know that there were people in the public relations field who, who looked down on, you know, PR professionals saying they could also be marketers and vice versa, because they were so separate for a long time. But if, um, you know, if you can be creative and look at other ways that you can own that content um, and earn that content, then I think you're going to be a lot more successful than if you approach it the way that we always have. Mm. I think in one of your blogs on your site, uh, I love this phrase, a good PR defense is a good PR offense, right? Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah. What does that concept mean exactly? Uh, preparation. I mean, really, we've seen in the last two years that no company is immune to a crisis. Um, between uh, trying to communicate the changes of COVID. I mean, I just think of the evolution <laughs> that our clients went through in the last year. So, I mean, you start with COVID coming up and having to make decisions about how you're going to pivot as a business. Are you going completely virtual? Are you changing how you're offering your products, how your customers can engage with you? It was such a lightning rod of an issue um, that you had to approach it in a way that would, um, not piss off a segment of your customers. Um, then you had politics wrapped up in that and you could have an employee or an executive kind of maybe be a little too vocal about some of those things. And then all of a sudden now you've, you've angered a, a, a portion of your, of your audience, larger organizations. I mean, we had a lot of, of clients who came to us where the larger the organization was, the greater the liability of your employees and someone posting something offensive or um, inappropriate on social media. And someone takes a screenshot of that and then they send it to corporate and they're like, do you know, this is your employee and is this what you stand for? Um, So there, there are a lot of crises that can occur that people have never thought of. And if you can be prepared for that ahead of time, you never know how or when a crisis will unfold, but you can proactively think about it and kind of bucket it out and be prepared so that when that happens, because things will start to happen quickly in that situation, that you're more prepared instead of kind of standing there going, oh no, how are we going to respond or putting your head in the sand and not responding at all, which is the worst thing you could do. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, And uh, parts of that certainly fall into this uh, bucket of reputation management. I think what can companies or small businesses be doing now kind of proactively as you're talking about to help uh, protect and uh, guide reputation management? You know, there are a lot of organizations. Tulsa is a very philanthropic community. And I know there are other communities like this. There are a lot of organizations that are doing really great things in the community. They're, they're giving back. They're allowing time for volunteering. They're taking care of their employees. Um, a lot of, you know, very admirable things that they just don't talk about. And 
the feedback that I get a lot of times is, well, I don't, I don't want to be bragging about myself. And, you know, I just feel like I do it because it's the right thing. And, um, and I totally get that. And people typically don't respond well, if all you do is brag on yourself. So I think that that's spot on. Um, however, when there is a crisis or something that maybe occurs that doesn't align with the principles of the organization, it's really helpful to have those things reflected somewhere. And so, um, just an easy thing to do is to start building out kind of a a newsroom or a repository of those positive instances. So maybe you have a blog area where you're talking about different organizations that you support in the community and shining light on them, Um, being able to empower your employees to talk about the, the different benefits that an organization provides. Um, But I, I just think that people don't do that enough. And so, um, you know, when the crisis does happen, you kind of look back and you go, oh man, I wish we had talked about that more because we're, we're doing great things. And now all people see are the negative. Mm, that is some great advice. Um, earlier, you had mentioned about this great opportunity, uh, a client or a company you were working with all of a sudden had this big investment. And you got to work on uh, relaunching, recreating a brand. I'd like to talk about brand identity maybe for a minute. How important is this for small businesses? so important. I think that, you know, it's, it's not cheap to hire a professional designer and to really, you know, put together a strong brand, but it, I just always believe you should put your best foot forward and people will pay attention to that. They pay attention to the materials that you put in front of them, the logo that you have on your business card, what your business card looks like. I even think the thickness of your business card, you know, there are a lot of places where people can cut corners and I completely understand, you know, I didn't have any money saved up when I started my business because I never planned on it. It just happened. But there were certain things that I knew were going to be very important because they were going to be reflective of who I was as a professional. And you might not be in the branding space, but your brand identity should match the level of service that you're going to be providing. I love that quote. The brand identity should match the level of service that you're going to provide. That is a great Mm -hmm. quote. Are there questions maybe that you could help our listeners who are many are small business owners? Are there questions maybe that you can provide that uh, small business owners can ask to help create their brand? So I think a great place to start and where we start with a lot of our clients are one-on-one interviews, talking to your customers, some of your, your star customers who really have been behind you. Um, I was really grateful for a group of, of uh, potential clients that when I started my own business said, Hey, Nicole, let's give this a shot, you know, and they were willing to kind of go out there and give me a try. And, um, and a lot of those clients have stayed with me for a long time. And so I, I value their opinion. I am always just so indebted to the, to the fact that they got me going. Um, and so talking to some of those clients that have been with you for a long time, um, that being said, our business has evolved a lot in the last eight years. So talking to some of your newer customers who have, have known you at this point in time, as you've changed, um, talking to customers where, you know, it didn't go well that you screwed up. There was something that you're just, you're not proud of it. You get that pit in your stomach. Every time you think about it, um, talk to them too. And I think that there are always lessons that you can learn from some of those things, but talking to all of those different segments really gives you what you're looking for are trends. What are the common themes that people are saying about you? And sometimes it's helpful to have a third party do that. So we actually did this, um, I guess it's probably been about four years ago. And we had one of our contractors call our clients. So that way they weren't talking to me. Mm. I wanted people to be able to speak freely and to anonymously give that feedback. Yeah, that's Um, a great idea. And and so we we asked things like, what in your own words, what does Resolute PR do? Um, And we want to know how they feed that back to us. And if they were to, if they were to only talk about media relations and public relations, then we know we have some work to do because we also do digital marketing and we do brand identity and we have a lot of other services. So it's helpful to know from your customers what they think you do. Um, What are, what do you think are some of their strengths? Have you worked with any of their competitors and how did they, how did they compare? What were some of the things that made them stand out versus their competitors? One of my favorite questions to ask is if you were the CEO, what would you do? 
Mm. And the, the ideas that some of these organizations have, they're so creative because they're thinking about it. They're coming from a completely different place. Right. Um, so, so you're really trying to get to the heart of who you are as an organization, what makes you stand out and where are you looking to go in the future? Um, and that, that doing that research before you engage a designer is going to be incredibly helpful in getting them going and moving in the right direction. Love that. that excellent, excellent advice. So I know with your company, with Resolute, I mean, this is your baby. I mean, you started, it was you and maybe one other, and now you have 10 uh, on staff. And um, so how do you motivate your team? How do you keep them excited about moving forward and about the company? Uh, this has been kind of one of those learning, learning curve things for me, because I did not realize how much that depended on me. If I was burnt out, they all get burnt out too. If I'm energized, they all seem to be energized. That's a lot of pressure as a business owner to, to, to keep yourself at that level. And no one can do it a hundred percent of the time. Um, but I really believe that the power in the power of one-on-one touch points, our, our team is small enough that I can do that. But at least with my senior management team, I'm meeting with them one-on-one every week. And we do talk about clients kind of at a high level, what's going on, but we also have the conversations of how are you doing? What's going on in your world? You know, and we, we talk about, we talk to each other as humans and as friends. And so I I think that that helps keep them engaged. I know it helps keep me engaged because then if someone's having an off day, I have some context for why, um, and I can be sympathetic and give them flexibility. That's another thing that I hear a lot from the team that they've really appreciated is the flexibility. Even before COVID, when I started my business, my kids were really small. I mean, my son was not even a year old. My daughter was four. So uh, I I knew that when I started this, I wanted to be able to be there for the school programs or to get away to pick them up from right. school every right. once in a while or do something fun. And I always have extended that to the whole team, whether they have kids or not. So I, th- I think that that's really important. And with COVID, that's just been amplified. You know, now we work in a hybrid environment. So we have two days a week where everyone works from home. And we have unlimited vacation, which is another perk. So uh, really prioritizing that self-care. I have two questions kind of bouncing (laughs) off of what you just stated. So first of all, um, two days when you work from home, do people kind of plan that on their own uh, uh, coordinate and say, okay, hey, uh, uh, Nicole, I want to work on uh, at home on Mondays and Fridays. Is that okay? Or do you segment it out like, well, we need some people here on these days and then, or how do you play that that schedule? Yeah, that, that has been an evolution. So pre-COVID, I did have a few employees who um, worked part-time. And so they picked the days that they wanted to work from home. And it was fine. I mean, they were getting their work done, but it it created some challenges just in terms of even scheduling meetings um, because you don't want to, you know, have someone come in on their day off technically right. to to be there for a meeting. So um, it it was a little challenging. And then so now we all work from home on Wednesdays and Fridays, and actually a, a half day on Monday as well. So what I found is that it's really important to have everybody in the office on the same day. Because that's when a lot of the collaboration happens. That's typically when the meetings happen. Um, so everybody's able to uh, to really, you know, do do that part of it. So that on the days when they're working from home, they can really put their heads down and get their work done. And not saying that it works 100% of the time. If a client needs to meet on a Wednesday right. or a Friday, we're not off that day. So we'll still do it. But we really try to kind of prioritize the collaboration and the in-person meetings on the days when we're here. Yeah, that seems like that would work much better. I, I was just, my uh, staff are all dispersed. And so everybody works from somewhere. Uh, I, I think it's kind of interesting to think, wow, how would that work? And I know there's tremendous value in having folks together in the office, if possible. And just mm-hmm. that collaboration, that vibe, that energy that you can get. So yeah, that's a great idea. I think it's great process. You also mentioned this thing that I love, unlimited vacation. How does that work? And I mean, that is a very progressive kind of idea as far as kind of planning a workforce. How do you manage that? 
Yeah. Well, it started kind of accidental because I didn't want to have to track it um, and no one was taking (laughs) advantage. And so I thought, well, we'll just keep doing this. Um, What I've learned is that we have to, um, we definitely have to put up some guardrails and and be a little more strategic about it. So we're, we're in the process of doing some of those things. Um, But at a high level, it's making sure, you know, one, you can't take a month off. So uh, it has to be within reason. And usually again, with us working from home on, on Fridays, that kind of uh, typically people will take that Friday off and then, you know, and then it's not so bad because really you're just missing one day in the office. Um, so, so yeah, usually people will take, you know, a week or just a few days on either end of the weekend. Um, and they have to approve, have it approved by their supervisor. Um, we don't like multiple people from the same team being out at the same time because you know that you're having someone else, uh, Uh, kind of step in. Um, And then everybody's been really great about still being available. If there's a question or, you know, they'll kind of keep an eye on their email so they can, they can check in, but uh, it it really has not been a problem so far. Actually, what we found is the opposite to be true. There are, there are people who, because they don't have that trigger of knowing that they have vacation that's about to expire, they just don't take it. And so we have to, we have to actually force some people to (laughs) get out of the office and take that time off to recharge. Well, I love vacation. And I know even if I personally, I could say, well, I've got unlimited vacation, I suppose. Um, But I like what I do. I like to work. And um, Mm -hmm. I'm one of those people that tend not to take time off, even Mm -hmm. though I probably should more. One of the things I think is a great example and a lesson for business owners, something that you do that we kind of stumbled across, um, but I think you do this very intentional, which is that you tend to celebrate a lot of your employees and highlight mm-hmm. and promote or recognize your team members um, through the company's social media, like Facebook. We've mm-hmm. seen just a lot of posts that you do and like celebrating, congratulating team member Randy for, Hey, you did a great job on doing this. We couldn't have done it without Randy doing this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That is a great example. I think in order to help kind of cultivate this culture with your company, how did you stumble across that? Is that just one of these natural, wonderful things of Nicole or was that intentional (laughs) that you learned through an advisor? (laughs) Yeah, no, actually it does not come naturally to me because it's not something that um, that particularly motivates me. And so I, you know, I'm the type of person that I just kind of put my head down and I do my job and I mean, I'll apply for awards and I like recognition, but I don't need it to, to feel like I'm doing a a good job. Not everyone operates that way. And so I did, I, you know, I had some great employees who have been with me for a long time, come to me and say, Nicole, like, this is something I struggle with. I need you to tell me when I'm doing a good job. And, and I always thought, well, I thought I was saying that, but they weren't hearing me, which means I wasn't doing a very good job of it. So I did, um, I talked to one of my business advisors about this and I said, can you give me some tips for how I can do this better? And I did put someone on my team in charge of our social media. And I delegated that to her. I said, I really want to make sure we recognize Um, birthdays. I want to make sure we're recognizing our work and that we, uh, that we profile, you know, whoever it was that worked on it. It's always been important to me that I'm not the only face of the organization and that people know that there are other people on the team who make the magic happen. And, and so that I think has always been something that's come natural to me, but yeah, I appreciate you saying that because that tells me that I've, I've come a long way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm giving you some recognition. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, well, and you hit a great line right there because I think it's a, it's a tremendous lesson for us all, which is just because w- we may think that we're doing it, but people are not hearing it. And so the perception mm-hmm. is really what counts is their perception, not because we think we're yeah. doing it as well. I think I'm doing it. Well, well how come you're not hearing it? Well, they're not yeah. getting it. Um, and so right. we have to change, uh, I think in the way that we're communicating or processing or doing whatever it is that we're doing, because it doesn't matter whether what Randy thinks it's really is the employee or my wife or <laughs> my kids yeah. Yeah. or whoever it is right in our organization. 
Well, and I, I have no data to back this up, but my hunch is that a lot of entrepreneurs probably struggle with this because if you were someone who needed a lot of feedback and recognition, sure. you probably wouldn't have made it as far as you have. Cause it's, yeah. it's a lonely thing to do. And, um, uh, so I, I think that, um, I'm, I'm glad that this employee felt comfortable enough to tell me that and to be honest with me about that. And um, that's, that is something that I've always really encouraged with the team is I have an open door policy. I want you to talk to me about anything that you're struggling with or anything that we could be doing better. And we have, we've had a lot of honest conversations. And so that, that's something that I've always really appreciated and encouraged. Yeah, good. Good steps forward. All right, Nicole, it's that time of the season. And it's time for the seventh inning stretch. All right. Before we started recording, I asked Nicole if she liked baseball. <laughs> and uh, been dreading this. Yes. <laughs> and her her comment to me was, uh, "Oh, I'm the most nervous about the seventh inning stretch." <laughs> <laughs> so I had to assure, her, "Don't don't worry, it's going to be easy." So the seventh inning, though, is where we get to ask you a little question that's kind of in your ball fields and expertise. We're going to talk about major league baseball logos, right? Brand identities. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Did you, so None a little, of them are oh, coming to mind right uh, now. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, a okay. little, a little background on the MLB logo. So it, it was designed um, by a gentleman, Jerry Duar in 1968 and it really hasn't altered a lot really since then. It, it really is pretty much kind of held that same uh, look since it was adopted back then. And it really was introduced at the beginning of the 69 series. And I never really noticed this until we started doing a little research on this. Like, oh, yeah. But they were kind of intentional about the way they designed it so they would be a little more ambiguous like if you look at you don't know whether it's a left-handed batter or a right-handed batter i mean they were really trying to get some stuff across that way so while major league baseball has kept their logo the individual teams are a little bit of a different story they've rebranded quite a bit actually and so we're gonna this is where we're gonna hit on the most logo changes is led by the atlanta braves They've changed their logo. I don't know exactly how old the team is uh, off the top of my head, but they've changed their logo 30 times since uh, oh the gosh. team has been <laughs> underway. Can you imagine changing logos that, that often? is crazy. The New York Yankees have had the longest current logo, and similar to the MLB, they introduced their logo uh, that they currently have in 1968, and they haven't looked back since. They decided, like, this is a winner for us. We're keeping it. The fewest logo changes were the Rockies, and they have the lowest total with just one uh, logo change since 1993. Here's your question, though, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing this by video as well. And she's kind of like, Oh my God, she's, <laughs> you know, this look, what is the average number of logo changes per team in the MLB? Oh my gosh. Well, that's 16. Not totally bad. guessing here. That's not bad. 16, uh, 11 actually is. So okay. yeah, All right. that, we'll call that a hit and you get on base. There you go with that. But yeah, 11 times. I know. So I live here in Cleveland and we are just, this is our first season with a new, we changed the name and we changed the logo. And uh, so there's a lot of processes and, you know, as you were talking about brand identity and relaunching or renewing a brand, you know, can you imagine what that would be like for a baseball team, all of the logos, everything in the mm -hmm. stadium that you have, let alone digital and uh, crazy, crazy. Yeah. There are so many assets that people don't think about when they talk about a logo change or or even a name change for that yeah. matter. And it's interesting. I, I, I don't know if it's a post-COVID, you know, everybody kind of has like evaluated themselves and is like reinventing themselves. And so we've had a lot of potential 
clients come to us wanting rebrands and I love doing rebrands. I mean, I think it's a lot of fun, but I do have to ask them, are you sure? <laughs> because <laughs> there are, you think about all of the signs, the t-shirts, the uniforms, yeah. the, all the tchotchke that you have. I mean, there are a lot of things that have that logo on it. And when people really will identify with that, that brand, you know, it becomes, it should become synonymous with the organization itself. And you see that and you, you immediately yeah. think of them. So it's a big undertaking. It is. Um, it is. We, yeah, even yeah. Uh, my agency, we rebranded out three years ago, I think a little more than three years ago. And I never really kind of thought about it at that point, but Oh my gosh, it was a, a big Mm -hmm. process of all of the assets that we had and to get it out there. But eh, it was a lot of fun. I think the Yankees have got it right though. If you got a good one, just hold on to it. So yeah. uh, Yeah. uh, All right. You you know, you get to the point where, Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, you get to the point where sometimes things just get so outdated that you have to. So like one that we just did oh, yeah. um, this last year was for the Port of Catoosa, which is the most inland waterway in the country. And it's right here in Tulsa. No one oh. expects that, but they have shipments come all the way from China to Tulsa. And their logo had been around for 50 years, but it, it was it was a tugboat. And in 50 years, the port has evolved so much. I mean, they have a huge industrial park. They have sure. rail, they have trucking. I mean, they have all of these different modes of transportation that all converge on this one location. And, and so the 50th anniversary was kind of the, the excuse for saying, hey, I think it's time to move beyond the tugboat and yeah. to do something different. Yeah, I can imagine, so especially, <laughs> especially in that, because it makes it, you know, a tugboat, um, would make it seem like it's not as nearly capable in today's world and environment, and especially in transportation mm-hmm. and, and uh, logistics. And you think a tugboat, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, I would think you would need to kind of modernize something like that. So huh. right. uh, very good. So we're going to get back into this. You are involved in something that uh, we have a commonality, which is the chamber of commerce and uh, you were actually recognized as Tulsa's Regional Chambers Young Entrepreneur of the Year. Uh, whenever that was, congratulations. I don't have the year on that, but that's <laughs> terrific. Um, I think it was 2018. Is that right? Yeah, it's been a little while. Mm-hmm. And see, I pulled that one out. Why are you involved in the chamber? Why do you, What's the value that you find? Uh, well, a few things. One, the chamber, while they weren't my first client, they, from the very beginning, uh, were a champion for me. Uh, they really valued me as, as a startup and I think saw potential in me and my business. And so they were really instrumental in helping me get connected to other businesses who could potentially benefit from what we did. So I'm always grateful for that. And they've been very flexible in, in finding ways for us to to sponsor things or to get recognition when even financially we couldn't quite make it, we would do trade or we would, you know, we would find other ways that we could be involved at that level. Um, Our chamber is very involved in economic development, very involved in education, very involved in policy. And so there are so many different places where you can get plugged in depending on your interest. And I didn't really know what my interest would be. So I, I, honestly feel like I've been involved in almost every single one of them. I would go to luncheons or I would, um, I chaired the, the one voice agenda process, which was basically a, a like a round table discussion, series of round table discussions to determine what they wanted the chamber to advocate for at a state level, but also on a national level. So I learned a lot in that process. So I, I think it has really helped me get plugged in with the business community and the issues that not just that we're facing, but that our clients are facing and to be better informed. So in moving forward a little bit and still wanted to kind of pick your brain on PR advice, um, small business owners may not have a big budget for PR. Where would you advise to spend their dollars and where is it not necessary to spend the dollars? Uh, Social media, I don't think is as necessary as it once was from an organic. So there, you know, there's organic content and then there's paid content. And with the algorithms working the way that they do, you can spend a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort on developing Facebook posts, Instagram posts, LinkedIn posts that frankly will just not be seen. 
And it's helpful to, to have a presence there and to post something every once in a while. But I would not have the expense of hiring someone just to do social media. Now on the paid side, that's a completely different ballgame. And so you have, you know, paid ads through Facebook or through Instagram where you can be very targeted right. in who you're trying to reach and, and serving those ads to people who would actually engage with your business. Um, same thing with Google and LinkedIn. We've seen a lot of success on all of those platforms. I, I would just tell people to proceed with caution. It's a little bit like a lightsaber. And so if you don't know how to use it, you can waste a lot of money too, or you could chop your arm off. So so proceed with caution, but there are a lot of training tools that are out there and things and, and a lot of professionals who do this too. And um, that's where I see more of that moving. What you can do is things that you can be doing on your own would be things like blogging or producing content. And then you can push that content out by backing it with a paid campaign. That's a great idea. Almost kind of segues and you, you almost answered already uh, kind of my next question I wanted to hit was how can small businesses begin to amplify their brand and, and their brand identity? And I think one of the things is what you just mentioned is creating content on their own, maybe through articles or blogs. Is there anything else that you can think of? Yeah. Well, just getting inside of the mindset of the customer, what are, what are they, what are they looking for? What problems are they having and how can you help them solve those problems? So like one easy technique that, that we use is you go to Google and have you ever searched something and then all of a sudden Google kind of populates what they think you're looking for? That predictive text, they don't pull that out of nowhere. <laughs> Statistically, a lot of other people are trying to solve that same problem. And so typing in some things that you think your customers might be searching and, and looking at what are some of those other phrases that are associated with that and then developing content around it. And content is not just the written word. It doesn't have to be just a blog. It could be an article that gets pitched and, and is written by your local newspaper or a trade publication. It could be a video and video doesn't always have to be highly produced. It could be something as simple as, you know, what we're doing right now on an right. iPhone. It could be an infographic. And there are a lot of great low cost tools out there like Canva is one um, that already has templates built out that look really nice for building infographics or, or different different graphics that you could be sharing. So there are a lot of ways to, to get that out there. But I would say don't just develop content for the sake of developing content. Make sure it's something that aligns with your customer. Yeah, that's great advice. All right. So here we come. We're down to the bottom of the ninth. And this is where I ask all of our guests, what advice do you have for the rookies in the game? So those people just starting out in business or those who already have their business and are looking for some guidance from some great veterans like you in the game? I, I think that um, sometimes people just need to hear you. You can do this. You wouldn't have gotten this far if you couldn't. And it can be really overwhelming when, you know, you get that first big project or, um, or maybe you've been at it for a little while and you get something that it's really big. Like this is kind of the moment where, you know, you're going to make it or break it. And just to have confidence in the skills that you have, that's what got you to this point. And you, you have worked really hard. You've done, um, you've done your homework. You have built a company. I mean, that takes guts to do that. And so to keep pushing through and to ask for help. If you hit a wall, it's not because you're a failure. It just means you need some extra help. And so invest in bringing in those advisors or, you know, other organizations, ask for advice. Don't be shy about that because there's, there's nothing wrong with saying, Hey, I need a little help here. If people would like to get a hold of you, we'll have these links in our show notes, but they can reach you via the web at resolutepr.com. Is that right? Yes. That's correct. Very yeah. good. Well, listen, Nicole, it's been so great getting to know you a little bit, having you on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been great to, to be here. Thank you for going easy with me on the baseball. <laughs> I was really hoping the question was going to be like, what's your favorite food to eat at a baseball game? Because that's that's typically where you'll find me yeah. is oh, yeah. <laughs> standing in line. But... Yeah. Well, that's a great question, <laughs> no, too. Great. I love that. Yeah. Um, no, it's been great having you on the show. I appreciate it. And uh, wish the best of luck and growth for you and the team at Resolute. Congrats. Thank you. Thank All you right. so much. All right, folks, that's the ball game. Thanks for joining us today. And if you like your show, please tell your friends, subscribe and review, and we'll see you around the ballpark. Running the Bases with Small Businesses is brought to you by 
38 Digital Market, a digital marketing agency committed to client growth with lead generation, higher conversions, and increased sales. Connect with us today at 38digitalmarket.com.